when black people would finally, uh, after enslavement, the, the area that black people were allowed to live in, the seventh ward was segregated. And so what happens when people don't have opportunity, when they're oppressed, when they're kept out of the mainstream, is un an underground develops. That's what happened in South Philly and Philadelphia and other urban areas. And I grew up in that underground, economic underground, which involved drugs and uh, other kinds of crime. Uh, I remember when I went to college, most of the clothes that I had were hot. That is, my grandmother shopped by people coming into the restaurant. She had a restaurant. We lived above the restaurant. Um, and um, so there was, uh, that's where I, what I was growing up around, crime, prostitution, drug use. But there was also a spirit of trying to work hard. The civil rights movement was happening, the 50s, the 60s, and so forth. And I remember hearing Dr. King's voice on the radio. My grandmother, we lived across the street from a community center. She was active in the community center. Her restaurant fed people whether they could pay or not. And she really inspired me to become a doctor. And I wanted to serve the community as she did by becoming a physician. So, uh, and then, you know, through the pandemic, I have been involved in issues around mental health and social therapy and working directly with Dr. Lenora Falani, developmental psychologist, uh, first woman to be on the ballot as an independent for president in all 50 states. My mentor, and, and, and talk more about Dr. Falani, but, but uh, so I was involved in community work with her you know, in different areas, and during the pandemic, as a physician seeing patients the emotional issues became really upfront, and I wanted to begin to address them in the office. So issues of loneliness, which pe people were isolated, uh, people were losing loved ones and couldn't visit them. I remember crying on the phone with a brother whose mother was in the hospital and she did not make it. I, had, I lost patients, and I became more actively involved in creating our mental health, which is uh, uh, an initiative that I'm involved in, I'll talk more about. We're doing it all over the city, Harlem, the Bronx. We want to open it up and do it more using theater, poetry, performance to help people make connection and deal with emotional issues, depression, loneliness, anxiety, and so forth. So I'm just very happy to be here, and I want to uh, turn things over to, to, the, to our guests, the doctors, Dr. Chanel Evans, and then um, we'll make a small. Yes, yeah, same. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dr. Fields. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am a licensed clinical psychologist. I'm originally from Arkansas, so you're going to hear some twang. <laughs> when I came to New York, it got worse. I don't know. So, um, so I am, I've been in New York now about 12 years. I came for my postdoc at Columbia Medical Center and the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Lived there for a few years, worked in the field at a state hospital in the, in the Bronx, Community Mental Health Center in Long Island City, um, and uh, began uh, the process towards a private practice, which is what I'm doing now, and have been blessed to be able to do that. Um, you know, the <clears throat> just position of COVID, it actually kicked me over into full-time private practice. And so that's been happening since 2020 and have been able to expand, so I have you know, clinicians working with me as well. And uh, the practice is generally based in Brooklyn, but uh, we're virtual. <laughs> so what I do is I focus specifically on uh, what's happening with black and brown folks. My, the university I went to were one of two HBCUs with a clinical psychology PhD program, so Jackson State University in Mississippi, went further south, can't help it. <laughs> and um, that gave me the great opportunity, so all the work that I've done over the course of my training was with black and brown folks. And so having that uh, keen eye and uh, research as well as clinical practice. So what do I do now? My practice is geared towards black and brown women, and my spiel is that we show up, we do all the things probably well and better than, than most folks around us. And when you show up well and you get things done, people tend to uh, minimize your needs. They tend to gloss over you, not uh, tune into you in certain ways. And so I wanted my practice to be able to especially target folks who um, show up in their communities, show up in their families, 
but may not be able to um, connect some dots with themselves personally in terms of self-care, and they also want to uh, continue to master, continue with their self-mastery and um, showing up in relationships. So, um, I also have a specialty in uh, chronic uh, folks living with chronic illness, invisible illnesses, and the, the, the living with chronic pain as well. And uh, I have two children, <laughs> and an 18 year old and a 14 month old, and uh, a couple plants. <laughs> I'm so happy to be a plant mom, right? <laughs> They're alive. <laughs> um, and yeah, I'll, I'll you know, share more as we go along. Good afternoon, good afternoon. I feel like I'm home. Um, yes. My name is Malika Small, formerly Thomas. I am an LMSW and a mental health clinician. Um, I work in a private practice. I am also no stranger to man as I used to work at First Corinthian Baptist Church with Pastor Michael Walmer and man um, doing voter registration and talk, dealing with uh, voter suppression and traveling all over the city, um, informing and engaging those about the power and the right to vote. So it's good to be back. And thank you to Goldie, um, Lisa, for inviting me to be here today. So I am a native of Syracuse, New York, but I've been in New York for over 20 plus years. So in my mind, I'm a New Yorker. Um, lived in the Bronx, recently relocated to Jersey. And I am doing similar work to my esteemed colleagues on this stage which is foregrounding mental health, particularly in black and brown communities. Um, during COVID, I got separated from my job. I worked at the Boys and Girls Club of Harlem. And it was also a prime opportunity for me to return back to school. So this is my second career, second master's degree. None of which really matters, that doesn't matter. But, um, that, that, yeah. And, and Part of the reason why I went back to school for social work in particular is because there is an urgency around mental health. Yes. And I wanted to be someone who served not only as an advocate for that, but someone who could create a safe space for black and brown people to come and to talk and to just be. And just like Dr. Phil said, right, it's not about a diagnosis. However, however, there are some serious issues within our community that we are not having conversations about around anxiety, around depression, around PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSS, post-traumatic slave syndrome, right? Postpartum disorder, right? All of these things that we are not really talking about. And so it was my goal to create spaces to be able to do that. So I am a mental health clinician and professional. That just means I work for a private practice and I meet with young people, families, individuals, providing individual counseling. Um, contrary to popular belief, I see those who have ranges of insurance, so those who have state insurance, um, those who have insurance in their jobs, self-pay, but I would like to also increase access to mental health services, right? It's not just about, and normalize the conversation, destigmatize the conversation around mental health. It is okay to not be okay. Let me, let me say that again. It is okay to not be okay. We come from Cultural resiliency is what I like to think of it as, right? Like our ancestors were strong and we come from strong people. And so like, I feel like that is part of why we see, see talking about mental health and seeking the services that we need as being a sign of weakness, right? It is not. So. That is why I'm grateful to be here today, and I hope that this is more of an engagement for you all to ask your questions and to engage as a conversation, rather than just talking at you about the importance of addressing mental health, particularly in our communities. 
So thank you. I'm glad to be here. So why don't we open up and talk about some of the issues in terms of the stigma. Uh, there, it is important, and we have an opportunity to have a dialogue uh, about these issues. And I hope people feel comfortable, you know, asking questions. Uh, the issue of, of the stigma. So, yes, we are a resilient people, and we have gone through a great deal as a people. If you think about it, what does it mean to have gone through enslavement? It's, it's you know, unimaginable for, for hundreds of years, from 1619 until after the Civil War. And that continues. So there is, you know, it, it's not just it happened to them, but we're here in 2024. It's, it's still a part of the structure of our country. And, and the discrimination, the bias uh, is still there. And so we want to open up that conversation and we would like to help. I think there's now a call for a movement to destigmatize mental health, emotional distress, suffering, pain, violence, adverse childhood experiences. I face some of those adverse childhood experiences. Uh, and so I think it's important for us to support each other, talk about it, build community. Social isolation is very detrimental. And I sit, so, you had your hand up, so I want to, go ahead. Can you talk a little bit about access to services? There are many people in our community who do not have... Come to the mic, Thank you. If you have any questions, come to the mic over here. Thank you to all the panelists and the participants. Does it work? Thank you to all the panelists and all the uh, program participants. My name is Joe Gonzalez. Can the panel talk about access to services, uh, particularly for those people who are either not working or do not have insurance? Because often when you go for medical treatment of whatever kind, you're required to present your health insurance. Uh, and that has, in and of itself, is multiple obstacles. Many people in the community don't have adequate insurance or they have insurance that doesn't cover uh, the, the, the cost of the uh, mental health uh, treatment. So can you sort of talk about that? I do know that some programs uh, are free to people because they're funded, but that there's, a, there's sort of a gap uh, in terms of uh, availability for uh, payment of those programs. So can you talk a bit about that, if you will? So yes, so I can say, I can respond, and then we can, uh, we can all respond to that issue because it's a very big issue. So obviously, there is a huge gap. It's a big issue. In inequality in medicine, Dr. King said, is the most inhumane because it results in, in death. Paraphrase what he said about that. And there is a lot of inequality. If you don't have insurance, then you can seek um, care at a you know, Harlem hospital or one of the city hospitals, or you can go to a hospital and, and try to see. But it's very difficult. It is a barrier. So what is the answer to that? We obviously can't, can't solve that problem. So one of the two things I have to suggest, one, is that I think we can do a lot more. This doesn't take care of the problem, but we can do a lot with using uh, other approaches. So I'm very big on, use, I, I do a creating a mental health workshop. Uh, and the workshops are free, and we're trying to train people in doing these workshops, building an environment. You, I use, I love poetry, and I use poetry. We're also working with theater artists, improv artists, to help people in a group it's a kind of a group therapy. I work with a social worker, a psychiatrist, social therapist, social coaches, therapy coaches. And we, we work together with the group and people can talk about their emotional experiences. We do an exercise, a theater exercise, where everybody says their name and they say an emotion. And then we bring that into the group. And people often give experiences of being isolated, being, having to try, you know, being suicidal having a lot of anxiety, whatever, but the group supports them. And we're able to use those struggles, that pain, in the group, to build the group. 
and help people, because I think that that can be very helpful. Now, that's one thing. The other thing is I think a lot of people have, have spoken to me here at NAN about looking, they're looking for, I'm sorry, they're looking for a black physician. And I have so many patients, I'm not supposed to be taking new patients, but I have taken a few because people ask me, and how can you say no? We need to put together, and we need, I mean, I've, I work at a medical school, we need to educate more African Americans, people of color, compassionate doctors who can work in our communities. And we also need to network. I'm so happy to meet my colleagues here. I met Chanel at a, at a another panel and glad to meet Malika and but what we do need to put to, to I was thinking of a committee to work on a resource collection, a list of black and other physicians of color, compassionate doctors, who people we can that, that we can share with others. Because that is a big problem. We are not going to solve that problem. There's no easy answers to this. I think we have to support each other. We have to work politically to change the, the fact that insurance is such a determining factor. Health is a right. You should be able to get health care, emotional care, mental health care, all kinds of health care, even if you can't pay for it. That should not keep you. It is horrible that that's the situation in our country. People get turned away because they don't have the right insurance. Or if they do have some kind of insurance, public insurance, Medicaid, they have to wait longer to see a specialist. I deal with this every day in my office trying to find, you know, specialists for patients. They wait in line. They don't get the same care. It's not equal. It's, in, it's inequality. And it's an injustice, which is one of the reasons I'm involved in activism. So that's a few responses, and we can continue. It's a very good question. Thank you. Thank you. The question, the question makes me think about, too, uh, the fact that if you Usually, we, we may know someone who's in therapy or gone through the therapeutic process, and them sharing their experiences or them passing along resources, right, that somebody else has recommended to them. Often, I find that for me, it's I, I, I intentionally work with adults because I'm like, if we can get mama together, <laughs> then family is going to be good. So, and usually, women we are sharing, you know, what we encounter, what's working for us, what's not working for us. So. Being mindful that if someone you know or if you've you know heard of tools, and the, the thing about the past few years is that it's really broadened the scope of like book clubs and other group-based meetings and things that people can have online that can provide a space for some sharing, some receiving, and being supported by other folks. So you know, keeping that in mind, and then also the fact that emotional wellness. Right is the A. So tons of books and things, you know, stuff that can be checked out from the library, things that can be um, consumed from online. There's a lot of podcasts now. A lot of people turn to those for support. You got therapists and other people who can podcast and provide a lot of good information that, if implemented and put into practice, can make a difference as well. Great. I'll just add as well. Um, I definitely had advocacy around policies and legislation, universal health care, right, for all. Um, and then, you know, don't count yourself out. Some practices will work with you. So if you don't have the insurance, right, they will be willing to talk, uh, to, to come down on fees. I have some self-pay clients, right? And, you know, I'm going to also say something that might not be a popular opinion, but if for some, not judgment. If you can go out and you can spend $125 on a pair of Jordans, then your mental health is important and that's something that you can invest in as well. Now, I do recognize that's a privilege to have $125, so let me just name that, but I'm, I'm speaking to those who use the fact that resources are not available to be able to get to a doctor, right? Or to get the help and the support. Also, normalizing, right? There are groups, this is what we did. Back in the day, my mom didn't have uh, necessarily access to therapy, but she had her girls group. They played cards, they met up, they, they supported each other. They supported new moms in the community. They did things like that to, you know. So it's, it's also about reprioritizing what you feel or deem as important 
and trying to get the access to it, right? So just wanted to add that. Yeah. Next question. Um, as a child, when I was growing up with my mom, all about six of us, um, I didn't know what my mother, who she was going to visit. I just knew she was going to a doctor. I didn't know it was a health care for mental illness. And when you say mental illness, because it seems to fall on like generation, because I don't, I'm going to give you an example for myself. I have an aide that comes to help me in my house. And when I, even here, they seen how I got loud. I don't know if that's falling under that when the person is agitated and they get loud and it seems like somebody is against them, then they lash out. But mine says, I, I get loud. And is that falling under mental illness? I think it's um, a part of, yes, I, I, I see you often. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Yes. yes, I think it's part of life. You know, mental illness is for everybody. All of us. We, it's something, this is, you get upset. Suppose you have not, hi bro. <laughs> Suppose you have been trying to find a job and unemployment is very high. You can't find a job. You can't feed your family. Suppose you're homeless. How could, you know, be, it's normal. There's certain things that will push a person into uh, a mental illness, if you want to call it that, emotional distress, anger, racism, you know, being discriminated against. We, Dan is marching every Thursday in front of Aiken's, Aiken's office, you know, um, against his attacks on DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So, uh, Matt, there, there's so much that is hard to deal with, hard to live with. Let's face it, life is hard. We need, we need to, to support each other, we need to build community, we need to deal with these things, but there, and people do get angry. So when, when folks get angry like that, you know, uh, I think it's important for people around them to say, what's, what's wrong? What's going on? To be compassionate, you know? And not just say, well, we're, you know, call the police or overreact or, you know, um, Anger is one of the things that happens with, with folks, and there's a lot to be angry about. Fortunately, with organizations like NAN, you can channel that anger in positive ways. You can express it, you can perform it, you can write a poem. It's one of the things we do in our, in our workshops, we do performance. So, someone, we, we did a workshop with a gentleman who was on the train, and, he, and somebody took his seat and he got angry, but he didn't get violent, and we performed that. What else could you do in that situation? If you perform it, you know, then it, it becomes something you can perform. You know, you don't have to just react. There's other things you can do, so you can learn to do that. But anyway, I appreciate the, the question. I think it's very important. We should be kind to each other, even when people get upset. Like the brother on the train, the homeless brother. And the, uh, uh, Jordan Neely. Yeah, he needed help. He needed somebody, he needed some help. He needed some support. Not what he, what he got. Um, I also just want, I wanted to just add to normalizing negative emotions, right? I think that being angry is viewed or aggressive or language like this is being, like it has a negative connotation to it. And some of the people that I work with in particular don't express, feel comfortable or safe expressing their emotions because they've been told for so long that they're bad and that they're negative and it's not okay to be angry, it's not okay to be upset. And these are very normal emotions. We are nuanced people. We can be happy, we can be sad, we can be angry, we can be all the things. And like, it is okay. And not feeling bad about having those emotions. Right, I just also wanted to add that. I'll say too that your feelings are not just there to mess with you, right? Like biologically, relationally, they have a purpose. The lower energy that comes with sadness, what do we do? We usually turn in when we start reflecting on things, we start thinking about things, we, we, we assess them. 
and that's a good thing, right? It's just when we get stuck in that, when we don't understand emotions and why we have them, that's really important. Like if you want to 10x your lived experience, study emotions, study how they show up in the body, study how they impact our thoughts and our behaviors and our relationships. Like if nothing else, that will make a big difference. Um, and I, you know, we, I work with women, but men, please learn about emotions. <laughs> tell it, tell it. We out here helping women level up, get themselves together. Y'all got to come home. <laughs> Thank you so much, and I agree. I'm a teacher, and life is social, physical, and emotional. Emotional. And I, my question to you is. Um, Things are very simple, and what you, what you said, doctor, about growing up with the war of drugs and sex and all immorality, I believe that the, the churches were like a field hospital, and they taught very simply. God is very simple, and for example, the trees, when they shut down, it's cryogenics. Cryogenics, when we sleep, we're replenishing our body, and it's all different systems. Why aren't we teaching that, like the brain is the nervous system, your heart is your cardiovascular, I'm, I'm sorry, your cardiovascular is what's the pump, and your reproduction is actually your heart, and that's in the Bible. Because your hair is dead, but it grows, so do your nails, and if they find it, they says you are a male or a woman. Now, our, our reproductive system uses the digestive system to rescreate. So why aren't we, like, the I'm lost. I need help because I'm impersonated and my blood is very rare, AB, and somebody's stealing my record to rob me. And, it's, and I was impersonated to the UN and to the Vatican. And, and I'm, I'm a, you know, that's why they're not curing cancer. They could cure with cryogenics. I had it done to me. Let us respond. Let us respond. Thank you. So that's my question. Why, why isn't it being told? Thank you. Well, I think an important point that you made was the, uh, the fact that the mind and the body are not separate at all. We have been sold a bill of goods. And when we think about our ancestral roots, you know, indigenous roots, what that is really, you know, first thoughts is like connection to the land our bodies being uh, in rhythm and in tune with what's happening around us. And we have so much nowadays in our societies that throws us off of natural rhythms. And what's, you know, the connection with um, uh, our bodies and the environment around us. So I worked in a school for a little bit and, um, you know, coming around the full moon, <laughs> Little Timmy and little Judy be popping off. Why is that? Because we're mostly made of water and our bodies are responsive to what's happening in our environment. So that is a very important factor. And colonization co-ops so much. It adds intermediaries where we don't need them. You know, and it takes what we've known historically and perverts it, subverts it, minimizes it, makes us think that we don't know nothing, right? But getting back to our roots and understanding that our minds and bodies are connected, I think we have known that, and we can re-engage with that and embody that all the more. Great. Thank you. Let's keep um, Next question. Good evening. My name is Kevin Johnson. I am a 9-11 survivor, and I've been diagnosed with uh, PTSD. Um, and I've been diagnosed with PTSD due to 9 11. It's one thing that has yeah. to do with that. My biggest, um, one of my questions, uh, maybe that's not okay. One of my questions, one of my biggest questions, one statement I'll make first and foremost yes, we have to learn emotion. And what I've learned through um, therapy is that it's all right to cry. It is. It's all right to cry. It's all right to sit back and take a I cry. Well, got to get the men in here, right? right. So I, I've cried. I've learned to cry. I've learned to accept certain things in my life. And um, it's, it doesn't make me less than the man that I was or who I am 
now. Um, but one of the biggest problems that I had when I was diagnosed with PTSD through 9 11 is I said to them, I'm about to tell my deepest secrets for what I consider PTSD to be and what therapy is. I love my therapist. She's next to my wife. She's it. But when I went to them and I said to them through the World Trade Organization, I said, I want to talk to somebody that looks like me. Absolutely. They can understand me. And I live in state New York, in Rockwell County. And throughout the five boroughs of New York City, there wasn't one person involved with the World Trade Fund that looks like one of you. My question is, why so? What do we do about it? Again, I'm happy. I love my therapist. But there's a lot of guys out there that's not willing to put themselves out there. So how do we fix it? Um, great question, brother. Thank you for your bravery. Um, part of the challenges with this are, the reality is, right? As a social worker, many of us are not paid well. <laughs> I got to just say that, honestly. Um, and that oftentimes causes there to be a decrease in those who end up going to the field, right? And this also ties to, again, racism, systemic racism, and access, right? That is a major issue around this as well, and gatekeeping. I was just talking to Dr. Chanel about that. I have to go through a million hoops to be able to get to the place where I can own my own practice. And when you are bound by private practices, they have their own goals, which is insurance and taking insurance, right? So some of these issues are a lot more systemic than just you not having access. But I also want to add, there are resources. There's places like Therapy, therapy for Black Women. There, there are people, black men, that you can go on those sites and you can actually find those. There's also an openness to um, telehealth. So I only see people via telehealth. I don't see people in person, uh, which is very nuanced too, right? Like actually being on Zoom and talking to, to a client, that's, that's new. That's cold, like that wasn't always happening. So that is part of the reason I think that it contributes, but I also market myself as someone who wants to work with people that look like me. That's not the reality for everybody, but that's something that I do with intention. Um, so, yeah, that's it. just wanted to add that. Okay, so I just wanted to add, into, we're going to go to the next person, but just to say briefly, also, we've been locked out of, of careers in, in, these, in these fields. A lot of young people in our communities would love to go into medicine, health, social work. We need to give them, we need to open it up. We have to fight to challenge these barriers and also help the young people to, to, be, to get really growthful developmental education. There's a lot of problems with our schools. Uh, I think that we, we need to support our young people and, and have important quality after school development programs, which I, I work with the All Stars Project's after school program. So, you know, let's keep going though, but, but it's an important question. Uh, one minute, we, we have questions on. back here. Uh, and please try to keep your questions very brief. Don't give statements or questions. Please stand. Hi. So my name is Crystal. I, don't, I got here a little late, so I don't know if you've already talked about this, but the Surgeon General and the U.S. Surgeon General Advisory on Healing Effects of Social Connection and Community has deemed our, there's an epidemic of loneliness and isolation. It's an 82 page report. I have it right here. And uh, it's 82 pages. And it's been declared that loneliness and isolation is written in stone at this point. And this report was done in 2023. I just wanted to mention that for those of you who want to maybe, I, there's no, I don't know how to share it on here. <laughs> but it's been declared that it's an epidemic. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we have to build community. Dear, we have to. Yes, I, I'm, I'm aware of that. Loneliness, isolation is detrimental, and it got worse during the pandemic. And we could do so much more in terms of the mental health, emotional distress crisis, and the suffering of our people, all people, by bringing people together. That's why I'm involved in, in the work. But thank you. That's a very important. 
and you know, the um, increase in social anxiety as a result of COVID, like, you know, some people who weren't, you know, necessarily uh, leaning towards introversion became introverted, right? Like more to themselves. Um, the aspect of going, you know, getting all, getting together and going somewhere uh, became much more tedious. And you don't know how people are going to receive you, whether they're going to receive you. So there's a lot that we have to rebuild by way of our own sense of self, as well as our skills in um, engaging with one another. Next question. Hi. My name is Lenore, okay, and I know about the mental health services, and um, I know it's a possibility everybody could be mental in certain type of ways, okay, but I think y'all need to change y'all system, okay, because it's making other people more mental, you know what I'm saying, about how y'all are doing your business in certain ways, so I'm going to give a comment, okay, my comment is, when y'all have y'all facility. You got to separate the facility on the women's side from the men's side. I think that would be a better way of doing it. Now, if you want to bring them together, you know, um, you're going to have to have more cameras to watch them together as well. That's the question. Could y'all do that? No, we, we cannot. Uh, we, didn't, we're, we did not design the medical institutions that you go to. Mount Sinai, et cetera, Columbia, those institutions were not designed. We want, we would, our priority, I think, if you speak for themselves, would be to have friendly, welcoming environments where people feel comfortable uh, to come. And I, I'm not sure about segregating the men from the women. I think we would want to have, you know, you have to put a lot of care into how you structure medical facilities yeah, I think there's space for same gender interactions, right? Like we need that. We need time for the women to be with women, men to be with men. Like there's so much need and space for that. I'm not sure that you know uh, changing the systems in that way um, would ever happen. But you know the fact that we do need spaces that are safe, um, you know, is 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 key because there are certain things that you'll say to women, you know, where you cultivated connection and um, safety that you wouldn't say in a group of men and vice versa. I also just wanted to point out that the, the comment about as mental health professionals, we can do harm. Like, I don't want to dismiss that. It is true. There are, there are people in the profession who can do harm. Um, sometimes consciously and subconsciously, right? Like, in, anytime you are you're, you communicate to a professional that you're, you're in pain or you're hurting and you're ignored and you're dismissed, that, that is harm, right? Or there, I've been in therapy pretty much for the last 10 years of my life. Therapy is a relationship. It's like dating. Um, and I've, I've had some really great therapists and I've had some not so great therapists. And there have been therapists who could not identify with me as a black woman and dismiss me and my needs. So, I don't, I don't want to dismiss the fact that we can do harm, and like the more aware and mindful of that harm, we, we, can, we, can, make, we can undo some of that. So you're right, sister. Thanks for bringing that um, to our attention as mental health professionals and physicians to be co conscious of how we can hurt those who we say we want to serve. Okay, before we go to our next question, I just want everyone to know we do have a vendor in the back, and she has some beautiful African earrings, necklaces, jewelry uh, for sale. So please, let's support our sisters uh, in the back there, uh, Chaplain Jade Whitehead. All right, she has a table, so when you have a chance, just go back and look at her items and let's support her. All right, thank you. Thank you. Next question. Um, congratulations to everyone on that panel. There is a fact that black doctors are rare. You're absolutely right, okay? That's, that's number one. This is a, that's a new thing. Number two, my problem is I, 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 I don't see anything wrong with uh, counseling. You, you, what you said about people being harmed, 
the professional people can argue. Um, that's called, which is called loud practice. It, it, it ain't legal, you're right. But I, I just want to say um, that uh, if, um, in behalf of uh, you being uh, doctors and all, and, and I've become a little nurse or whatever from all of the trouble or whatever I've been through and I've got my uh, education. But uh, the question, I, I forgot. Uh, amen. Oh, don't, amen. Don't diminish it, sir. Okay, thank you. We have uh, a few more questions, so we need everybody to be as brief as possible. We have her, Megan, Anthony, and then I'll come back around. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Kansen, and I'm a local clinician like you guys. One of the things I would like to ask you guys, how do we as a community um, focus on better educating families, family members who support people with mental health illness? I think when we talk about these dealing with the stigma of mental health, particularly in the black and brown community, I think our biggest challenge is how do we get those family members who um, are living with them, um, now that we see such a rise in our young people between the ages of 18 and 25 with severe mental health, particularly black men, how do we as a community come together to begin to address those issues and what would you do in your practice to really help support the family members living with these individuals. So one one thing, and we'll have everybody respond. I'll, I'll just say I think it's important to have the whole family in the therapy in the group to, to relate to the whole family, not just it's not like just one person has a problem, the person who may have the condition, but the whole family has to support them and has to grow and they have to be able to make demands. So family therapy, I think, is important and having conversations with the whole group, the entire family, because really it's the family that you want to support the family. I mean, it's hard. I, um, in my practice, we have some clients who, they've come to services because they have folks in their family they're supporting who are dealing with serious mental illness, right? So the folks who are the supporters, the folks who are the caregivers, need care too, right? So being able to, to let folks know that, that they should be seeing about themselves as they are supporting their loved ones. And when I worked at the uh, State Hospital in the Bronx, we had a family services center, right? The idea was to have books and, and things available so that families could come and, you know, talk with me or talk with some of the other staff, get some support around their roles. And just the fact that it is a lot to care for people who are dealing with uh, serious and persistent mental illness. Yeah, creating space for caregivers is definitely one way. Um, family systems therapy, if you have one person dealing with uh, a mental health issues, you definitely have to incorporate the entire family. Education, um, I particularly, like if I have a client that's caring for someone, for example, with like Alzheimer's or dementia, um, I pull in resources with a client to let them know like these are some of the expectations or to educate them around what dementia looks like, what sundowning is. Like I have conversations because also a lot of people don't know. They don't understand what the, the symptomology is of these, um, some of these challenges, right? People don't understand what comes with depression. Some people don't understand what it means to come with anxiety because of their own lack of awareness or, um, you know, just ignorance, blind ignorance about those things. It is letting them know the symptoms and kind of having those conversations and normalizing this is what you can expect because uh, this person is dealing with this particular diagnosis. So education, I think, is really, really important and you have to have the conversations with everybody involved not just the person, the actual person going through whatever it is. Next question. Hi. Um, my question is about warning signs. Uh, I'm 45, and when I was 19, I was diagnosed with depression. When I was 29, I was diagnosed with PTSD. And that's all because of a, a traumatic childhood. Um, and between the depression and the PTSD diagnosis, I believe if I had known the warning signs of what to look for, 
I would have been diagnosed with PTSD probably at 19. I would have known and, and expressed and shared those warning signs. So <clears throat> just as a share, if you can share, you know, some of the basic mental illnesses, depression, anxiety, PTSD, you know, whatever it is that you think is basic, just to share some warning signs with people so that we know what to look for, so that we don't wait too long to either share the facts or to get help. Great, yeah, great question. So I listed some, because I figured we'd talk about the, the, the basic ones, right? Um, excessive worry to the point of being fearful, right? Of worried about the external world. And this is it, these are signs of anxiety. Sometimes there's, norm, there's healthy versions of, and normal versions of anxiety, and then there are some that can tend to be a little bit excessive. If you're constantly paranoid, thinking that your neighbor is going to steal from you or trying to harm you, um, restlessness, if you are dealing with not sleeping, like most of us should be sleeping an average of at least six to seven hours per night, if you find yourself sleeping two to three hours a night, your mind is constantly going, um, you have thoughts potentially of like self-harm or harming yourself, harming others, these are some signs. Um, impulsiveness, so like spending, right? Like you get $500 and then you go out, you have it on Friday and then by Monday all of it's gone. Those are some of the warning signs of anxiety. Um, if you're constantly irritated, um, jumpy, there's panic attacks that can come. Sometimes you feel like you can't breathe, your heart is lit, like it, it mirrors that of like a heart attack. Your heart is literally like pounding out of your chest and you're, and you're finding that you can't breathe. Um, there's, there's something called ruminating, uh, which is the constant just overthinking about the same thing, like your mind just can never get quiet. It can, never, it can never just be still, it can never just be present. These are some of the warnings, and nightmares. Those are, that, that is a qualifier of like, let's say PTSD. If you're finding yourself nightly having nightmares upon nightmares, waking up out of your sleep, these might be signs that something is not okay. I'm not saying that that means there's a diagnosis, but maybe something to kind of talk to your PCP about and let them know that you are experiencing this on a daily basis for a long period of time. Not just like a one-off, but over a period of time. So that's particularly around anxiety. Next question. Next question. Next question. Next question. Okay, so we have a few more minutes before the closing, so we're gonna to try to get five more people before we close, all right. Hi, my, my name is Anthony Nance. Uh, first off, let me start off by saying, uh, Anthony, go ahead. You let, let me start off by saying, I, I apologize, Dr. Fields, because I didn't make it on Sunday to, to the event. I really love what you That's doing. okay, Anthony. I'm, uh, I'm seeing you now. It's great to my, see you. My, my, question is, my question is, after, after all the studies that I've gone through and everything and all of the entropy, i found that there is a particular rhythm due to the circumstance of everything that will cause communication for everyone to come to an answer of how to create correction in all of our lives with the trauma. Uh, how do we go about finding that rhythm? Yeah, thank you, Anthony. Um, I think we have to create the rhythm. We have to come together <laughs> in different uh, gatherings and keep working on creating it and then take it with us as we move through our lives. We, you know, we, in our workshops, which you've attended, which you've attended, we do, we read poetry, we do theater, we come together, we, ex we express, I'm sorry, we express what's happening in our lives and we build with it. And then we continue that, we, you know, we're, we're meeting on a regular basis. But basically, we have to create that ourselves. We can create a lot in, in groups, using all the resources that we have as a community, including our history, to continue building off of what, what's been done in our communities and by our people. Thank you for your question. Right. Keep going. Next question. Um, it's, a, it's a statement. Um, it, the reason why I, I suffer 
with a lot of that stuff that we are talking about. I still never got no help when I was raped at 10 at, with a family member. And I still suffer with that. And I'm not, I had a good therapist. And if men is not gonna speak about it, it happens to men that got raped. It happened to me, and I was 10 years old. My mother didn't know what to do with this person in our family. And it, and it was a generation of men in our family that tried to molest my cousin, her father. I got raped by a member, a brother. I don't consider him a brother. He's a rapist. He, my mother thought putting him in a mental health facility would help him, but when he came back, he attacked for us in the house. And we were trying to hold him against my mother. He was too strong for us for in the house. And I still didn't get no help. When, when that doctor told my mother I was raped at 10, I blanked out when, I, when it happened. And my mother came upstairs from uh, my godmother's house. And I, I, I woke up in the hospital. And all I heard was the doctor said to my mother, I was raped, and I still don't do, deal with nobody that does it. That's why I have a hard time, I have a hard time. Thank you. Thank you, sister, for sharing that. I think that, um, you know, if we were doing a workshop right now, we would, we, would, we would gather with our sister who just shared that. She just gave that to us. That's, that's not unusual. It's not unusual. Adverse childhood experiences. I suffered from, I, I went through those kinds of experiences in my, in my life. And we can, so that happened. So you're here with us. You're sharing that. We can build with that. That's part of what happened to you. You can continue to work. This is a very strong moment. This is a powerful system. Yes, it is. Yes. You just gave us that. Yes. Yes. You're going to be with her. Yes. You're going to stand up for her. holding hands, with holding your hand. We're walking with you. Yes. You had that experience and you gave it to us. It is here in the yes. room. It's not just yours now. It's ours. Yes. We're going to go forward. Yes. Thank you. Next question. Next question. Yes. With all the mental health uh, that has been focused on, uh, is there any help for people who are going through domestic abuse along with that? Because it, atta it attaches to your mental health. And around the pandemic, it did state that statistically, uh, domestic violence heightened around the pandemic. So is there things out there for people who are going through, along with the mental health, domestic violence as well? Thank you. Um, yes, ab absolutely. There are there are tons of services for women um, who are dealing with DV. There and there are free resources. Um, I personally, in therapy, work with women who are currently um, in domestic violence relationships. Um, so yes, it is definitely a topic that is important and that we are not ignoring. If you want to talk after to get uh, some specific resources and names of facilities, I'm sure we'd be able to help you with that. But we don't we don't want to to uh, ignore that. Yeah, that's confidential for sure. And anyone, right? Like it's not always gender based. You know, women hit too. Right, and so dealing with the rage, dealing with the anger, dealing with the um, lack of being able to handle one's own emotions. Everything's always somebody else's fault, the blame. The, the, so it, it, the people who do the perpetrating of harm need services and support too. And being able to acknowledge that that's where you are takes a lot of courage. Yeah, some questions on the front. Hello, my name is Delroy Askins, and my question to the panel is, what's your position on psychotherapy and how effective 
is it when it comes down to emotional, um, physical, and the mental illness that you guys are here speaking about? Did you hear the, did you hear the question? I have a question. Oh, okay. Um, I think you can have all these interventions and psychotherapy is just one, there's DBT, there's CBT, there's, like I can, I can name all the, all the types of therapy, um, but there also needs to be some willingness to want to get past the hurt, the harm, and the trauma. Um, there has to be the desire to want to seek the support and believe that healing is possible. Like, for some, they struggle, right? So it's like getting them first to recognize that there are challenges. We've normalized so much. Like, we believe that so much is normal. I talk to people and they're like, that's not normal? And I'm like, it's not for me to judge, but there's some stuff that's just not normal. And you first have to get your, wrap your mind around that. So these, these psychotherapy, all of these methodologies to be able to help or support people who want healing are good, but I think first it, 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 it starts with the person wanting to see something different in their life. They want to see change, right? So I would just, yeah, I, I hope that made sense. Yeah. They're effective, but you could be a therapy for five years and the needle won't move. Yeah. So I, I just want to add that, yes, I agree. And also, I think we need new approaches. New, uh, and there's a lot of new developments coming up. I mentioned some of them that we can use that don't involve necessarily a prescription, that are not part of the establishment, that are outside of traditional institutions. Uh, there are play therapists. I think play and art therapists, theater therapists, music. We need to expand all that and develop it and do research around that and study it. I think that could be very helpful. All right. We have two more questions and then we're closing. Come on, sister. So thank you all for uh, showing up and um, sharing your knowledge. I think it's important. Dr. Yu, uh, in the middle, you spoke about uh, how the environment affects people, and I think that's important. Um, what I didn't hear, um, though, is you know some of the root causes besides the fact that, yes, we you know, personally might have gone through some traumatic issues or trauma when, when we were younger. What about the foods that we're eating, the environment that we're living in? Because I think we can use a lot of preventative measures also to help with a lot of this, uh, the, the mental health crisis that we're, we're currently dealing with. Yeah, thank you uh, for bringing that back up. I mean, even the gentleman's question around rhythm, right? Like if finding your own personal rhythm in life. Like there's so much that's pushing us. We gotta go, we gotta do, we gotta be, we gotta produce, we gotta do all these things. And it gets us out of touch with our core and who we are and what's most important to us. We're often trying to fulfill what's most important to someone else, right? Meet their deadline, their expectations and so forth. So when we talk about mental health, we have to talk about gut health. What are we consuming, taking in? Are we eliminating enough? Okay, because <laughs> being full of things in your gut does impact your mood. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about anybody else, but I will preach a good bowel movement can change yeah. your mood. <laughs> Sometimes you need to release in other ways. Okay. That's right. That's right. And your mind. And your mind, right? How much, how, much, how much social media? How much TikTok? How much Instagram? How much harmful videos are you seeing of us being hurt and harmed day in and day out? How much news? How much negative content are you pulling in on a daily basis? Stuff that does not make you feel good. And yet we spend five, six, seven hours scrolling, right? That is also like, let's not forget about that too. And the importance of minimizing what you are physically taking in, what you're emotionally taking in, and what you are mentally taking in. 
and also bird culture. Uh, many of us all capitalism, right? We have we have right. We have quickly become victims to grind culture, not resting. Resting is considered as what? Lazy, right? If you don't sleep, if you're not having five jobs, and you're not going and going and going and going, then you're not viewed as being productive. These are all toxic beliefs that take us away from who we truly are and what we want and need. And what we haven't really talked about is then we've got all this going on. How are we usually trying to cope? Some of us through alcohol, you know, liquor, drinking, drugs, and so forth, and so many things that we think that we are kind of checking out a little bit, getting some relief. But if that thing isn't energizing you towards who you want to be, how you want to show up in the world, then it's taking away from you more than it's giving you. And we have to evaluate that and be honest with ourselves. Okay, our last two questions for Rio. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Jamal. I represent an FQHC. Those that don't know what that is, that's a federally qualified health center. So to elaborate on what the gentleman had said about access to health care, um, they provide health care at no cost. They'll take you if you don't have insurance. Um, in addition to that, she actually took my question about social determinants of health. Um, so I want to know why, what, why is it important to address uh, why is it why is it important to uh, address the uh, social, social determinants of health? Um, and then before I let you go on that, uh, I also am in a position to help folks that are in the healthcare industry looking for jobs, whether it be an RN, LPN, nurse practitioner, or even a physician. So we have uh, an organization in the Bronx called Bronx Community Health Set, uh, Network, which uh, we actually have a doctor that looks like us. Um, and we are actually building a uh, health center on 218 Street, uh, White Plains Road. So with that said, uh, we can answer the question, but if anyone is looking for a job, because I think that that's the number one key to helping you address your mental health, then it also contributes to how you eat. So making sure that um, you have a job in place so that you can eat healthy, because I believe that food is health, and preventive care is the goal to um, you know, in terms of the social determinants of health, one of the first things that I always talk to people who come and see me for therapy is I'd like to talk about the context in which we live. There's so many layers of things that are uh, uh, beating us down, if you will. So many layers of things that make life more difficult than it needs to be. And we have to acknowledge that because what we do naturally as humans is that we internalize things and we think it's us. And if you're holding on to so many things that you think are you, but they're not really you, they're just consequences of the situations you find yourself in, then we have to, we have to unpeel those layers, right, so that we can get to who we actually are and feel better within ourselves. Okay, our last question right here. One more, there's one up there. It's not really, it's kind of like a statement too, but like, you understand what I'm saying? It's, I didn't even start speaking, but that's what, that's what I'm saying. It's like, it's like I honestly feel like it's a thing with everybody, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, it's like I can't even walk down the street and say hi to a female without her thinking I'm trying to run down on Cause like, And that's because that's what dudes do, you understand what I'm trying to say? It's like a, it's, I really think it's, what I'm trying to say is like, everybody got to come together, that's, that's really the only way, and it's hard, it's, Way harder than it seems. Like you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's like it's like you know you say with the therapy thing, how you need somebody you can talk to and this and that. It's like it's this. How do I say it? It's like it's like you trying to hide from somebody to talk to. It's like it, it's you understand what I'm saying? If everybody was together, if everybody was together, it'd be easier to do that. But since everybody's so divided, I feel like I need to hide from somebody. So to what helps talk us about come together? Good. Right? I don't you, know. you just gave an example of saying hi to somebody on the street and you get a you know, certain type of reply and rubs you the wrong way or whatever. You don't Do we take play. a moment to think about why that person replied that way? We don't take a moment to give space to the fact that everybody's going through something. You know, we're quick to judge, we're quick to um, misalign people and get them attitude back. But sometimes recognize that we're all suffering 
right? Yes. Bring empathy into the space. Yes. Bring compassion up to our minds. But sometimes compassion is hard because when we haven't been met with it, when we haven't experienced a lot of it from people in our lives, we don't know what it is. We don't know how to give it. We don't know how to show up in those ways. But I hear you, right? Like everybody's going through something. And if we can all be a little bit more gracious with one another and a little bit more patient with one another, we can, can resolve that. Thank you so, so very much. Come on, put your hands together for our wonderful panelists today. None other than Dr. Fields, Dr. Malika Thomas, and Ms. Chanel Evans. Come on, put your hands together. I need everyone on your feet. This was an amazing, amazing forum today. We cannot thank you enough for just being present, to kicking off uh, the Women Auxiliaries, Women History Month. We always have to give a shout out to our chairwoman, none other than Kathy Jordan Sharpton, and the president of our Women Auxiliary, none other than Lisa Gordy Harps. So, we want to tell you thank you, thank you, thank you. We cannot thank you enough. I know a lot of people want to come up and find out how they can reach you guys on social media with your platforms. So maybe if you take a half a second before I pray us out, if you want to just tell us how they can reach you. Dr. Phil, may you start with you, please? How they can reach you on, on social media. Well, so Jesse Fields 1616 at Gmail. Um, the allstarsproject.org, eastsideinstitute.org, those are all organizations I work with. If you really want to be in touch with me, I think you have to you have to exchange information. I'm not really on social media very much. So, okay. Thank you so much. We understand. Um, DrChanel.com. I have a QR code up here because I, you know, usually get caught up in conversation with somebody. So you can scan and it'll take you to my website. Um, and my practice is, is connected to that website. So I have cards, I'm, I have a <laughs> love-hate relationship with social media as well, um, but I, I do understand the importance of it for promotion. But I do have business cards and will share my information. I also would like to extend myself to come back at any time to do some healing circles. I didn't mention that. I do um, can lead Sawabana healing circles to my sister in the back who uh, was vulnerable about being a survivor. That is unfortunately a rites of passage of many brown and black girls. Um, I am a survivor um, and talk very candidly about that. So um, for those who'd be interested, please have us come back so we can do an actual healing circle to show you what real healing looks like, not necessarily in therapy, right? Um, to, to deal with some of the traumas that, uh, that we live with. So thank you so much for having us. Thank you so, so, so very much. Um, so House of Justice family, this was a heavy forum today, right? Yes. A lot of people are suffering silently, yes. and you just don't know. That's why it's good to be good to people, to be nice, to be kind, because you never know what someone's carrying. And in that same vein, I'm going to ask everyone to be still as we go to God and close out the forum today. Let us pray. Most gracious and wise God, we first come to tell you thank you. Thank you, God, for just being the God of who you are. God, today was a little heavy for some people. But God, we thank you that they were able to set themselves free by telling their story. God, we never know what someone is going through, but we ask you right now. That everyone under the sound of my voice, God, whatever it is that they're suffering, that they know that at the midnight hour when no one else answered the phone, God, all they have to do is call upon your name. Yes. Call upon your name and say, God, be with me. Yes. And if they can't say anything, God, all they have to do is just wave their hand and you will interpret what they need. God, thank you for the woman of Missouri. Thank you, God, for the life of Kathy Jordan Sharpton, God, who has been doing so many things for so many women for so many years. So many lives have been changed just for her just being present. We ask you, God, to continue to cover her. We ask you to cover every single woman, God, that's under the sound of my voice on this afternoon. God, help us to be better after we leave here today. Help us every Saturday at Women's History Month to be better when we leave, man. God, and always, 
we ask you to continue to cover our president and founder, Reverend Dr. Al Sharpton. Continue to cover this place. And this we ask in nothing but your matchless name and all of God's children said, Amen. God bless you all.